Welcome to the Security Weekly News Wrap-Up for the week of 25 October. Wow, 2020. Dorsey, Zuckerberg, and Pikai in the Senate hot seat. Kashmir Black, healthcare under assault. Typo squatting. WebLogic, uh, bug bounties, and the NSA strikes back. All this and show wrap-ups on the Security Weekly News Wrap-Up. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. It's the show that keeps you up to date on the latest security news twice a week. Your trusted source for accurate security information and expert analysis. It's time for Security Weekly News. Do you know where your organization's crown jewel data is, whose data it is, what it contains, and if it's flagged, tagged, and classified accurately? Defense In Depth requires discovery in depth. At Big ID, they help organizations uncover dark data, classify sensitive and regulated data, meet compliance requirements, and take action for data on prem, in the cloud, and everywhere in between. Learn more about how Discovery In Depth can change the way enterprise organizations find, classify, and protect sensitive data at securityweekly.com forward slash big ID. Increased attacks, skill gaps, talent shortages, expanding attack surfaces. Cybersecurity and IT teams face these real issues every day. CyberAfer Teams is the number one NIST aligned DoD 8140 and 8570 compliance certification and skills training platform. CyberAfer Teams makes managing teams easier, guarantees measurable training outcomes, and keeps your team's skills sharp to meet today's biggest security threats. And did you know 96% of the Fortune 500 have employees training on CyberAfer? CyberAfer for Teams, now you know. Visit cyberA.it forward slash solved to solve your team training challenges. All right. Welcome to the Security Weekly News Wrap-Up Show. First, all the show topics from this week. On Application Security Weekly number 127, Mike, Matt, and John had their guest as uh, Cesar Rodriguez, who is the head of developer advocacy at Acurix. Cesar was on to talk about cyber resilience, which means building security and security controls into your life cycle rather than just, you know, like afterwards. So you develop it all, and then like they go, oh, yeah, we should call the security people and ask them if what they think. I mean, that's, that's what they've been doing, right, for like the last 50 years. Uh, and then, you know, they have them do a test or, or something. It, it's kind of like if you built a bridge, but you didn't really think about safety. You just thought about like we need a, you know, the bridge has to be long enough to lay across this gap. And then like after you got it all built, somebody came along and said, oh, yeah, we're going to drive cement mixers across it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but he was particularly focused on how movement toward the cloud makes this even more important. So a, a segment worth watching. On Business Security Weekly, number 193, Paul, Jason, and Matt, uh, or Paul and Jason only, it was Paul, Paul and Jason and Matt had um, Matt Ashburn. Okay, sorry, I was trying to remember... There was multiple mats there. Matt Ashburn, sorry, Matt Ashburn, uh, the federal engagement lead from Silo, which is a cloud-based web isolation tool from Authenticate, with an eight on the end. Uh, I'm really interested in this tool. I think these are very interesting tools. I've seen them being used in different ways. Uh, where, like at, at the university, they were using them to secure stuff. I've seen them used in testing centers. Uh, and this is a tool to be used in a secure environment, so you can run that secure environment on a non-secure machine. And when I used to work in, uh, in, a, in a, a special facility, um, you know, we actually had two different machines. So we had one machine and another machine that had red all over it. And yeah, and so that was to tell you which one was which and so forth. I really want to see more of this uh, so I can work on all my screens instead of that 12 inch greasy laptop that the client you know, loaned me to use in the cubicle where the hobo was. And you know what I mean by where the hobo was, right? If you've ever done consulting. Yeah, that, that's the cubicle where they're like, I don't know if they died in there or those chalk outlines just mean that maybe they made a kind of mess, but I'm sorry about the smell, but okay, bye. Uh, in the second segment, the crew talks about strategic tech trends for 2021 from Gartner, uh, critical strategies for tech leaders, uh, also for, uh, in Gartner's CIO agenda. agenda? What am I, from Massachusetts? Uh, uh, is the cybersecurity industry selling lemons, which was interesting, uh, and some concerns uh, boards really care about for CISOs, and there were some other topics there too, so they had a whole nice little uh, laundry list of things to talk about on that show. 
On Enterprise Security Weekly number 203, Matt and Paul had the news, and then their first guest was Jeff Capone, the CEO and co-founder of Secure Circle, uh, to talk about conditional access for software as a service uh, apps. Uh, and, and of course, what that means is, is how do you control what can be accessed and what's out there? How do specific data sources uh, get managed, and how do you continuously enforce conditional access to the data on an endpoint? Yikes. I mean, that definitely a, a really interesting topic to me. Uh, I, I have conversations about that all the time. Uh, I've been having conversations about that for 30 years where people want to know who has access to it, how do you control access to it, and with all the stuff that's been going on in the last couple of years, it's just become just tantamount, so definitely worth checking out. On the last segment, Alexa, uh, Alexi Papaleonardos, the Cloud Incident Response Manager at CrowdStrike, talked about current trends in security incidents on public clouds. Uh, they talked about trends in breaches and how you may want to prepare yourself for using the public clouds. Uh, very timely stuff. Uh, everybody, again, that's questions we get asked all the time. Is this safe? What's happened? What does that mean? And so on. On the Security Weekly News, number 77, uh, Roger Hale from Big ID joined me to talk about big data pri and privacy. Um, I was really excited to talk to Roger, and we had a really nice conversation about that. We, I think we talked more about privacy in the context of how your information is attributed to you than about how to protect your privacy, because uh, it, was, it was an interesting way to look, at a, uh, to look at privacy. I'm always trying to sort of back in toward my no privacy is all privacy uh, stuff from Arthur C. Clarke and all that, but I really like, Roger immediately started talking about attribution. And I really liked that. And I thought, wow, I, 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 and I told Roger on the show, I was like, we, we could probably talk about this for two or three hours. Uh, and and we, we kind of, I think, got to the point where it's not really whether someone can see your file, because they've probably already seen it if they want to, but rather, can they change it? And can you validate that it is yours? more than how do I keep somebody from seeing my social security number? It's more about can you protect that from being modified or used without your approval? So, so attribution was all what that was about. Uh, or maybe retribution, no, not retribution. Uh, on Security and Compliance Weekly number 49, Jeff, uh, Josh, and Scott had Frank Price, the VP of Product at CyberGRX to talk about CyberGRX and how you can better work with third-party partners safely and efficiently, efficiently. Third-party risk management, uh, that kind of stuff, very relevant. Again, you know, I always love it when I see shows that on that week that were things that I had people call me about that week, uh, and I had somebody call me about this very thing. I was talking about this very thing in a meeting, uh, like, actually this morning. And, you know, third-party risk and, and how do people get through into that. Uh, for a second segment, Alan Espinosa, the Director of Security Operations at Online Business Systems, was on to talk about security monitoring and, in particular, uh, security tuning and asset clarification. So this, back to what we were talking about earlier, uh, I think this is just a critical topic these days. And, I, and like I said, I talked to Roger uh, Hale from Big ID uh, that we, can, we got, and probably why we ended up talking about it kind of from that perspective was it was on right after that segment aired on Tuesday. And so they were talking about the same thing. On Paul's Security Weekly number 672, later today, uh, Roy Cohen, uh, the co-founder, and Shani Dodge, uh, who's a C++ developer, they're both from Vicarious. Uh, they were on a couple of weeks ago with that fun threat poll thing they did. Remember that? That was pretty cool. Uh, they're back uh, with more on vulnerability characteristics. Uh, this time they're talking about observing and analyzing user interaction and other software characteristics to really create a complete picture of the threat. Uh, in the second segment, Paul Batista, the CEO and founder of Polarity, joins the show to talk about how Polarity uses computer vision working like augmented reality uh, to observe data. Uh, Paul is going to talk to Paul about how Paul's Polarity works as a tool. Yeah, it uh, should be cool. I I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and of course, uh, we'll have the news uh, later this evening. My favorite threat of the week is going to have to be critical infrastructure threats. Uh, I've, I, I mean, I don't really keep up with which one of these I've talked about before because I just like to show what I'm thinking about that week. So way back when, when the world was young, I was working with the Rhode Island State Police, uh, which had one of the first and best uh, computer crimes unit in the world. 
uh, in my in my humble opinion. Uh, and I was thinking a lot about how to use my experience in disaster planning, now called continuity management, and general delusional paranoia, which is still called general delusional paranoia, to try and maybe do some public good. So I started writing scenarios around those kind of things that we've been doing for corporate uh, as tabletop exercises. And we took those tabletops and talked with a lot of emergency agencies, state agencies, uh, and public service agencies like healthcare and things like that about threats that were being posed to critical infrastructure and, and you know, how a, a, a virtual disaster or even a physical disaster uh, in conjunction with a virtual disaster might all combine to really create a dire circumstance in the modern age. And, and initially what I got was those same looks I got when I asked corporations what would happen if the CEO, CISO, CIO, COO, and the entire C-level hee-haw gang were in one of those Wolf of Wall Street yacht parties and a meteor hit the yacht. I actually said that once at a board meeting. And, uh, you know, and I got that look, you know, that like, right, yeah, it's never going to happen. But I did see that light bulb start to go on during the first decade of the 21st century. And now it seems to have turned into kind of a bat signal because we are seeing the real world disaster strike, the desperate need of critical infrastructure during a pandemic coupled with a busy hurricane season leading into a, I don't know, Christmas Sharknado kind of situation, Pand Pandnado. Tordemic, I, I kind of like Tordemic, Sharkdemic, Election Day alien landing combined with an outbreak of hyper cholera from another planet. Mm, okay, I, th I like I like that one best, and, but I don't know. Uh, but this week, several reports came out about the increased targeting of healthcare by ransomware nastiness. And what I learned back in the day was that hospitals and, and care facilities, uh, who are you know absolutely critical in dire situations are very network dependent uh, today. Uh, whether that's the inability to develop x-rays, that was one of the first things I heard from a healthcare provider we were talking to was that they used to, you know, they took the film and they took it and they developed it in the bath and all that stuff like you used to do with your black and white, you know, film when you took photography in college. Um, and, and now it was all digital and, the, and they didn't develop anymore and they didn't have the chemicals to develop. And uh, how to use paper records, you know, used to uh, medical facilities were, you know, just piled to the ceiling with paper records and they had all these weird, you know, tabs and things. Uh, but they, now they're all shipped to storage in Ogallala, Nebraska, uh, last year or, or, oh no, wait, they're down here in the sub, sub, sub basement that is filled with rats, brown water, and a spectral ap apparition that looks a lot like Stephen King. Um, so I think we need to up the game with the interaction between federal, state, local, emergency management, and the industry to ensure that we can create the level of cyber resilience that we need in all these, these absolute must assets. Uh, I did meet with a lot of healthcare people back then, and I know that they will do their best uh, regardless, uh, but I would really rather that they can focus on sewing my face back on than having to worry about did the records all get ransomware and they're trying to use a paper chart that really says, you know, my name is Kurt. Um, there were 10 major incidents that shut down or partially shut down healthcare facilities in the United States just in October, and there were, mo there were more. So I actually have another news story where there were more actual incidents this, this week, uh, still in October, than we had already reported. And now all the top news. The NSA, uh, the National Security Administration in, in uh, uh, in the United States, published a list of top vulnerabilities that Chinese hackers are targeting, and the top 25 are listed in this article. Now, all those things, I looked through the, the article, and you can too, but I, I, I was reading this, all, all of them were documented. You know, it wasn't like they were saying, oh, we don't know how they got in. It was like every single one of them, all their top 25 was stuff that, that we know about, and we've talked about. Uh, so why are they still exploiting them? Well, take a big guess, because they aren't patched. Uh, so the top 10 were Pulse VPN, and I'm not going to go into what they all are because we don't have enough time on this show and, and we've been over it before. Pulse VPN, Big IP, Citrix ADC, Blue Keep, uh, Mobile Iron, Sigrid, and NetLogon 
were all uh, the heavily, most heavily targeted. I don't think that was 10, but that was all the most, some of those are, there's like multiple uh, vulnerabilities and different things that were the same. Uh, that was the most heavily targeted according to the report, but all of those have been out for a while and um, all of them are patched, I think. So, so patch them. Uh, because, you know, they're, these are the ones that people are, and these are nation state people actively pursuing. So it's not some 12-year-old kid in Guangdong. It's, it's probably GRU, Chinese military, uh, you know, and, who, and, and, and a bunch of 12-year-old kids in Guangdong and San Diego. So, you know, it's like patch this stuff. Uh, your CMS site, is, it may well be infected with Cashmere Black. Uh, this is a new botnet that focuses on WordPress, Joomla, Drupal, and all the others uh, that are out there running on CMS servers. Uh, it is a framework botnet. And I use that term framework to, defi to, to describe malware that is got sort of plug and play features to it so that you can let it either adapt itself on the fly or you can adapt the script in advance so that it pulls down different tools depending on the application. So, you know, kind of like commercial, actually not like commercial, so a lot better than commercial software. Um, and, and this particular botnet uses a variety of vulnerabilities in CMS systems to gain access and then uses packets disguised as Dropbox, GitHub, et cetera, uh, type stuff to exchange and download additional components from the command and control servers. I mean, basically what they're counting on with this botnet is that a lot, and I'll tell you, a lot of CMS servers never get patched. So people build these things up, they put them out there, it's you know, the HR community, you know, information site, and people update the information on them, but the servers are active and they sit there for years and years and they never get patched or updated because nobody wants to touch it because then it may crash or it may stop working and you'll end up doing service calls. So you know, basically, uh, the, a lot of these vulnerabilities can persist and get reused, uh, and then basically once that happens, the botnet can get in and spread the botnet far and wide. Uh, several different reports on this botnet came out this week, and one of them reported that more than 230,000 instances of this botnet are very likely running right now on CMS platforms. So, you know. The Nokia Threat Intelligence Report for 2020 came out this week, and they showed that IoT device compromises had increased 100% in 2020. Uh, it seems that COVID-19 combined with ever-increasing numbers of IoT devices uh, in use is really a bad combination. And by COVID-19, I mean people going home to work. I don't think any of you listening will be shocked by that report. Uh, and they had a lot of other data in there. But they did indicate that 33% of all infections observed in mobile and Wi-Fi networks were related to IoT takeover, which was double the number that they observed in a similar study in a similar way in 2019. So the combination of external visibility uh, by IoT devices, third-party controls, vulnerabilities, command and control servers managing this stuff from the cloud, uh, all made IoT a growing area of concern. I mean, I mean, even though it was already an area of concern, I think it's actually growing even more. Add all that to your enterprise network now being bridged by VPNs to, to lots of home networks who are, which are filled with IoT devices. Uh, and I hope you didn't use any, any uh, rules or split tunneling on the network, or maybe you should use split tunneling. Uh, you know, I'm not really, <laughs> I mean, I, I always go back and forth on split tunneling because it's like one way you're routing tra all traffic through your network, or you can do split tunneling and half the traffic's going through your network and other parts staying on the local network. But the general, the general advice uh, is that you should not be using split tunneling because then you're not managing uh, the, the home network, which is connected to your network. So you probably should be using split tunneling. But it's definitely something to be thinking about. Um, you know, you might also want to check out the silo segment on Paul Security Weekly later because that's kind of a related to this as well. If we could run something like that silo tool on home machines, maybe we could isolate the, the users there and keep some of that stuff out of there. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't looked at that tool, so uh, hopefully we'll know more later. Uh, I know I talked about this earlier, but I did want to mention this story from this morning. It showed two more hospitals were targeted on Tuesday, one in New York and one in Oregon. Both were hit with Riot ransomware. Almost all these attacks were Riot ransomware, uh, and, they, and they were shut down. So on Wednesday, CISA issued a joint statement with the FBI that said, uh, quote, credible information of an increased and imminent cybercrime threat to U.S. hospitals and healthcare providers was ongoing. 
So, you know, this is not just the usual business as usual. Somebody is actually actively going after this. Uh, healthcare is, is a growing, very specific target, so be careful out there. Xfinity and McAfee were targeted by parked domain attacks, according to Palo Alto Research today. Um, I mean, this is an old approach, and we've certainly seen this down through the years that, you know, was basically used by porn companies initially. I mean, I don't know if you remember this, but I remember when WhiteHouse.com was a porn site. And I, and, and I did accidentally type WhiteHouse.com in front of an audience of about 1,000 freshmen back in 1997 to illustrate the, the many uses of that new interweb thing that was out there. And it was all on big screens. And, yeah, it was like, wow, you know, kind of, uh, yeah, it was, it was bad. Um, got a, I had to go to a lot of HR meetings over that. Um, I think a lot of people made rapid notes in the class, though, and, and I probably should have gotten a royalty early on. But unlike that honest mistake which dumps you into a porn site, this report is reporting on malicious attacks where the page is a redirect uh, to an Emotet installer. Uh, so that was one thing they did. Uh, the, the one they documented specifically was called ValleyMedicalAndSurgicalClinic.com, which uh, was, some, was for that. Typo squatting was also something that they were talking about in there, which refers, if you don't know, to domains where the name is just a little bit off. So the one that, was, that came up was xifinity.com instead of xfinity.com, which, uh, which is a Comcast site. Uh, but if you go there, you get sent to an apparent McAfee page that is, starts blinking and says, you are infected and your antivirus subscription has subscribed. Oh, no. Subscribed? Expired. I don't know what's going on. Um, that's what I get for drinking in the car. Um, if you click uh, on this, it, it takes you actually to McAfee where you can buy the legit antivirus. Uh, so it wasn't Emotet on that one, uh, but the, apparently the result is that they're doing click-through ad revenue with this. So they're getting paid to get people to be driven to the site, which is the old approach as well. Uh, so this is a pretty complicated problem without an easy solution because there's so many possible derivatives of DougWhite.com and... No, that's, that's not me on DougWhite.com. So it's a guy with a guitar, but it's not me. Um, this, uh, this next report showed that bug bounties are up 26% in 2020. Uh, I guess a lot of people are sitting at home with nothing to do, so why not? Uh, hunt some bugs and cash in. I'm a huge fan of bug bounties. Uh, the most rewarded flaw uh, this year so far is cross-site scripting bugs. Uh, and according to the article... Uh, 23.5 million has been paid out this year in bug bounties, so I think I need to stop uh, reading you the news and start hunting bugs. Uh, typical uh, cross-site scripting payouts are about 500 U.S. dollars, with 3,650 being the average for critical vulnerabilities. Uh, Oracle's WebLogic server flaw, CVE 2020-14882, is reported to be under active attack. Uh, this flaw is rated 9.8 on the CVSS scale. Uh, a warning that you should assume it has been compromised is stated in the article. So it's a low complexity attack, which doesn't require privileges and allows exploiting via HTTP. There is a patch in the October critical patch update, but you know, you have to apply it. The NSA continued to fight back against U.S. Congress this week regarding the belief that the NSA may be putting backdoor Trojans into commercial tech products. It has been long established that the NSA has tried and very likely succeeded uh, down through all the years to get agreements with tech companies to allow them to put special access into various products to improve their ability to have special access, which is mostly based on all this information was based on uh, uh, Snowden's whistleblowing. So basically what they want to do is to be able to scan everything on the Internet without warrants to see if they can get, you know, information so they can get warrants, I guess. Um, after Snowden leaked this, they reputedly added new procedures and, you know, have been continually scrutinized by Congress, who claims that building in backdoor access may allow other people to use it when it gets compromised, a la, say, the clipper chip fiasco back in the 90s. Uh, it may be a violation of the Fourth Amendment rights of the U.S. Constitution for uh, U.S. citizens. That amendment, if you aren't familiar with it, guarantees your right to privacy from policing without a warrant, which is why you can't do wiretaps and all that kind of stuff. The NSA has declined to comment on just how they updated their approach, and Congress has been pressing for more information. U.S. Senator Ron Wyden, who is on the Senate Intelligence Committee, is leading the quest for more information from the NSA. So I guess if you have some, maybe Maybe call them. I don't know. And finally, are you now or have you ever been a social media platform? Uh, at a, a recent Senate hearing on the 28th, so was that yesterday? 
uh, CEO Jack Dorsey, CEO of Twitter, was asked if Twitter, if Twitter could, sir, could Twitter influence elections? And uh, Dorsey just goes, no. You know, and then there was more outrage on the other side, like, like all those things. The Senate was talking to Dorsey, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, and Sundar Pichai of Google about bias uh, on the major platform, the major social media platform, uh, with both parties, so both political parties in the United States, you know, claiming that they're being unfairly targeted by big players. Maybe you, you just both suck. I don't know. But both sides are saying, you know, oh, no, this is biased against me. This is biased against me. Uh, right, left, upside, downside, doesn't matter. Uh, but basically the three mega billionaires uh, that were called in to, to address Congress when asked these questions basically said, <clears throat> no. Uh, apparently Ted Cruz does not like Twitter, from what I could tell. Uh, and that's the news wrap-up for the week of 25 October 2020 in the time of plague. I will be right back here in a couple of hours on Paul Security Weekly, so I hope I see you there. Keep it zipped on Zoom.